On each side of the midline are the rectus abdominis muscles, which go from the fifth, sixth, and seventh ribs down to the pubis. Between the rectus muscles in front and the posterior abdominal wall behind, there are three sheets of muscle, one inside the other. This one, the innermost, is the transversus abdominis. Its fibers run horizontally. The uppermost ones go from the lowest four ribs to insert on this sheet of tendon, which goes to the midline. Outside transversus is the internal oblique. Its fibers arise from the iliac crest and fan out in many directions, the highest ones inserting on the lowest three ribs. Outside the internal oblique is the external oblique. It arises from the lower seven ribs and inserts partly on the iliac crest, partly into this broad tendinous sheet, the external oblique upon neurosis. The body of the pubis, the ischiopubic ramus, the pubic crest, the pubic tubercle, the pecten, and the pubic symphysis. Before we look at the muscles, there's one important structure that we need to add to the picture, the inguinal ligament. Here's the inguinal ligament. It's a strong band of tendinous tissue that goes from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. There's a gap between the inguinal ligament and the underlying bone. Through this gap, some important structures pass from the abdomen to the thigh, including the femoral vein, artery, and nerve medially, and the belly of the psoas and iliacus muscles laterally. The inguinal ligament isn't an isolated structure. As we'll see, it's the lowest part of the external oblique aponeurosis, which is the outermost of the muscular and tendinous layers of the anterior abdominal wall. Now, we'll move on to look at the muscles that make up the wall that surrounds the abdominal cavity. We'll begin with the muscles which, along with the vertebral column and the diaphragm, form the posterior part of the abdominal wall. We'll look at the erector spiny muscles and their surrounding fascia, then at quadratus lumborum, then at psoas major and iliacus. We're looking from behind. Here's the iliac crest. Here's the 12th rib. Here's the midline. Here are the muscles known collectively as the erector spiny. We looked at them in the first section of this tape. They arise from the sacrum and from this part of the iliac crest. They're inserted on the thoracic vertebrae and on the backs of the ribs. The erector spiny muscles are enclosed on the front and on the back by this envelope of tendinous tissue called the thoracolumbar fascia. The layer on the back of the erector spiny arises from the spinous processes. The layer on the front arises from the transverse processes. The two layers of thoracolumbar fascia fuse into one thick layer along the border of erector spiny. The thoracolumbar fascia is an important attachment for muscles of the abdominal wall, as we'll see shortly. Next, we'll add quadratus lumborum to the picture. Here's quadratus lumborum. It lies in front of the erector spiny muscles and their investing fascia. Quadratus lumborum arises from the 12th rib and the transverse processes of the upper three lumbar vertebrae. It's inserted on the most medial part of the iliac crest and the transverse process of L5. Quadratus lumborum assists in producing lateral flexion of the lumbar spine. Lying medial to quadratus lumborum is psoas major. Psoas major arises from the transverse processes, vertebral bodies, and intervertebral discs from T12 to L5. It runs down across the ailer of the sacrum, across the sacroiliac joint, and along the pelvic brim.
Before seeing where Psoas Major goes, we'll add its close neighbor, Eliacus, to the picture. Here's the Eliacus muscle. It fills the iliac fossa. Eliacus arises from this wide area on the wing of the ilium. Down here, the medial fibers of Eliacus and the lateral fibers of Psoas Major join, forming a single muscle belly known as the iliopsoas. The iliopsoas runs beneath the inguinal ligament and passes backwards to insert here on the lesser trochanter of the femur. As they slope downward and forward toward the inguinal ligament, the iliacus and psoas muscles are covered by this layer of dense connective tissue, the iliacus fascia, which we'll meet when we look at the inguinal ligament. This is just the lower part of it. The iliacus fascia is covered in turn by the membrane which lines the abdominal cavity, the peritoneum. This is a preview of the peritoneum. We'll see it more fully later in this section. When we're looking at the abdomen, we tend to see psoas and iliacus as static background structures, but they have an important function. They're the principal muscles that produce flexion at the hip joint. Now that we've looked at the individual muscles, let's take an overall look at the structures that form the posterior abdominal wall. To do that, we'll add the diaphragm to the picture. The steeply rising diaphragm forms the highest part of the abdominal wall, not only at the back, but all around. The diaphragm makes a dome-shaped partition separating the abdominal cavity below from the thoracic cavity above. At the bottom, the middle part of the posterior abdominal wall, formed by the vertebral bodies, becomes continuous with the wall of the pelvic cavity here at the sacral promontory. On each side, the psoas muscle stands away from the vertebral bodies like a pillar. The iliacus muscles, with their investing fascia, form a continuation of the posterior abdominal wall that slopes downward, forward, and inward, ending here at the inguinal ligament. This is the lowest part of the anterior abdominal wall. In this dissection, all the abdominal blood vessels and nerves have been removed, together with most of the peritoneum. We'll add those structures to the picture later in this section. Now, with our focus still on muscles, we'll move on to look at the four muscles which form the great expanse of the lateral and anterior abdominal wall. These muscles fill in the huge gap that's created by the costal margin above, the edge of the thoracolumbar fascia behind, and the iliac crest, the inguinal ligament, and the pubic crest below. Here's the rectus abdominis, together with the innermost of the flat muscles, transversus. The rectus abdominis is a very long muscle, wide at the top and tapering to a more narrow attachment at the bottom. It arises from the fifth, sixth, and seventh costal cartilages. It's inserted on the pubic crest. The rectus is divided on the front by these bands of tendon called tendinous intersections. Sometimes there are three of them, sometimes four, as in this case. The intersections go about halfway through the muscle. The action of the rectus muscles is to produce flexion of the lumbar spine. The rectus muscles act in opposition to the erector spinae muscles. Besides producing active flexion, the rectus muscles have an important static effect. They keep the lumbar spine straight at times when the force of gravity tends to extend it. In the intact body, the rectus abdominis is enclosed on the front and on the back by a tendinous envelope that's formed by the aponeuroses of the three flat muscles. This is the posterior layer of the rectus sheath. The posterior layer ends here, about three quarters of the way down the muscle. Sometimes it ends gradually, sometimes abruptly, with a distinct lower border known as the arcuate line. Below here, there's just a little loose fascia 
between the back of the rectus and the peritoneum. Now we'll add the anterior layer of the rectus sheath to the picture. The anterior layer extends all the way from the costal margin to the pubis. If we incise the anterior rectus sheath and try to retract it, we can see that it's firmly attached to the tenderness intersections. There's one here, another one here. Here, we've divided those adhesions so that we can retract the anterior rectus sheath medially. The two layers of the rectus sheath come together near the midline. Here's the posterior layer. Both layers insert into this dense midline band of tenderness tissue, the linea alba. The linea alba extends from the ziploid process to the pubis. We'll see more of the rectus sheath as we look at the aponeuroses of the three flat muscles. We'll look at the flat muscles next. Flat may not be the best word to describe them. In the vertical plane, they're markedly curved, as we'll see. We'll look at all three of them, then we'll look at their actions. We'll start with the innermost of the three flat muscles, transversus abdominis. Here's transversus abdominis. The fibers of transversus all run in the same transverse direction, except the lowest ones, which run obliquely downwards. Transversus abdominis has a long line of origin, from here to here. At the top, its fibers arise from the inner aspect of the costal margin, from the sixth rib to the twelfth. Between the twelfth rib and the ilium, transversus arises from the edge of the thoracolumbar fascia. Below, it arises from the inner aspect of the iliac crest. The lowest fibers of transversus arise from the most lateral part of the inguinal ligament. Transversus has a short, free lower border. The muscle fibers of transversus end in this broad sheet of tendon, the transversus aponeurosis. The transversus aponeurosis fuses here with the aponeurosis of the overlying internal oblique muscle to form one aponeurotic layer. Now we'll add the internal oblique muscle to the picture. The internal oblique arises from the thoracolumbar fascia and from the iliac crest. The lowest fibers of the internal oblique arise, like those of transversus, from the lateral part of the inguinal ligament. Like transversus, the internal oblique has a short, free lower border. The internal oblique fans out so that its highest and lowest fibers run in markedly different directions. Back here, the fibers of the internal oblique run steeply upward. Here, they run less steeply. Here, they're transverse. And here, towards the inguinal ligament, they run downward. The highest fibers of the internal oblique insert on the lowest three ribs. Its remaining fibers end in this internal oblique aponeurosis, which, as we noted, fuses on the underside with the transversus aponeurosis. It's also joined on its outer aspect by the external oblique aponeurosis. This is the cut edge of external oblique. From here to here, the combined aponeurotic layer divides at the edge of the rectus into two layers, one passing behind and one in front of the rectus. Below here, the combined layer doesn't divide, but passes entirely in front of the muscle. Now that we've looked at the internal oblique, it's time to add the external oblique muscle to the picture. Here's the external oblique muscle, the outermost of the three flat muscles. The fibers of the external oblique spiral downwards and forwards at the side, downwards and medially in front. The external oblique arises from a broad area on the outside of the rib cage, all the way from here on the twelfth rib to here on the fifth rib. The zigzag line of origin of the external oblique fits in with the line of origin of serratus anterior.
Though it's all one continuous muscle, we'll look at the external oblique in two parts. A posterior part that arises from the 12th to the 10th ribs, and an anterior part that arises from the 9th to the 6th rib. The anterior part of the external oblique ends in this external oblique aponeurosis. This fuses with the combined aponeuroses of the other two flat muscles to form the anterior rectus sheath. The external oblique aponeurosis has a long free lower border between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle. As we've seen already, this free lower border is the inguinal ligament, which we'll see in detail shortly. The part of the external oblique that arises from the 10th to the 12th ribs remains fleshy from its origin to its insertion. It inserts along the outer edge of the anterior half of the iliac crest. Here at the back, the external oblique has a short free border between the 12th rib and the iliac crest. In this dissection, the body has been divided in the midline. Here's the anterior superior iliac spine. Here's the pubic symphysis. Here's the inguinal ligament. It's the lowest part of the external oblique aponeurosis. Laterally, the ligament is attached to the anterior superior iliac spine. Medially, it's attached to the pubic tubercle. The cut edge here was created by dividing the external oblique aponeurosis along this line. The edge of the inguinal ligament can't be seen from the outside because the fascia lata, the investing deep fascia of the thigh, is attached to the ligament along here. To see the edge of the ligament, we'll go round to the inside. Here's the edge of the ligament. The iliacus fascia, which has been removed in this dissection, comes down over the iliopsoas and is attached to the ligament along here. The lowest fibers of the inguinal ligament curl around to form this triangular extension, the lacunar ligament. The lacunar ligament runs backwards and a little upwards to insert on the sharp upper edge of the superior pubic ramus, the pectin. The lateral part of the inguinal ligament gives rise to the lowest fibers of the transversus and internal oblique muscles. Here's transversus. Its lowest fibers arise from about the lateral one quarter of the inguinal ligament. Now we'll add the internal oblique to the picture. Here it is. The lowest fibers of the internal oblique arise from the lateral one third of the inguinal ligament. The tendinous fibers of these two muscles arch over and unite to form this flat tendon, the conjoint tendon. The conjoint tendon is attached to the pubic crest and also behind to the pectin. Now we'll bring this lowest part of the external oblique aponeurosis up to its natural position and add the rest of the aponeurosis to the picture. Here it is. There's an opening in the external oblique aponeurosis, the superficial inguinal ring. Through this, the spermatic cord, or the round ligament, passes as we'll see shortly. The fibers below and above the opening are called the inferior crus and the superior crus of the superficial inguinal ring. They're attached to the pubic tubercle and the pubic crest, respectively. The inguinal canal passes through the superficial inguinal ring, then beneath the free borders of the internal oblique muscle, and the transversus abdominis muscle. To see where the inguinal canal begins, we'll go round to the inside. It begins at this arch beneath the lower border of transversus, which is called the deep inguinal ring. Here's the spermatic cord with its outer layers removed. To see the structures that run inside the cord, we'll go round to a rear view again. The deep inguinal ring is here hidden by the transversalis fascia. The iliacus fascia has been removed. The structures that pass through the deep inguinal ring and into the spermatic cord 
are the blood vessels to the testis, the testicular artery and vein, and the vas deferens, which passes over the pelvic brim and into the pelvis. Emerging from beneath transversus, the vas deferens and the blood vessels are surrounded by this coating of internal spermatic fascia. Now we'll add the internal oblique muscle. The internal spermatic fascia is surrounded by this layer of muscle, the cremaster muscle. Here's the cut edge of the external oblique aponeurosis. We'll add the rest of the external oblique aponeurosis to the picture. As the cord emerges from the superficial inguinal ring, it lies in front of the pubic tubercle, here. This edge of the superficial ring is a dissection artifact. In reality, it's continuous with the outermost layer of the spermatic cord, the external spermatic fascia. From here, the spermatic cord goes down into the scrotum. We'll look at the testis in volume five of this atlas. Now, we're about ready to move on to look at the principal blood vessels and nerves of the abdomen. Before we do that, let's review what we've seen of the muscles and the structures of the inguinal region. Here's the thoracolumbar fascia, quadratus lumborum, psoas major, and iliacus. Here's rectus abdominis, the tendinous intersections, the posterior rectus sheath, the arcuate line, the anterior rectus sheath. Here's transversus abdominis, the internal oblique, and external oblique muscles. Here's the inguinal ligament, the lacunar ligament, the deep inguinal ring, the superficial inguinal ring, and the spermatic cord.